Hey everybody, this is Kevin at Skylabs bringing you another video. Um, like I always say, it's gonna be a fun one. It's Valentine's Day in Des Moines, Iowa. It's rainy, it's really, really cold. I figured it'd be a good day to, to talk about my biggest mistakes and mistakes I see people making when purchasing vintage audio equipment, whether for, for their use or for resale. There's gonna be a lot of really good information in here. Hopefully it keep you from making some bad purchases and adapt. So, you know, my goal is always to learn from my mistakes or if I can, which is really hard, learn from other people's mistakes. So I got a feeling everybody that's been in the vintage stereo hobby has done most of these. I can't imagine me being the only one that uh, has experienced this because I do see customers come in quite a bit that make these mistakes quite often. So should be some really good information in here for you. Um, stick around. And before we get into this video, I always have a couple of things I need to announce. Uh, the first one would be we did launch our membership program. This is the entry level tier. It is $2.99. It gets you some really cool emojis. It gets you some loyalty badges. It'll get you priority in the comment section to our videos. And this is the silver package at $2.99. Definitely go check it out. It's a really great way to help support the channel. Look at it like buying us a cup of coffee or something like that. And we all love coffee, especially me. So if you do feel like you're getting some good information out of these videos and you feel like you want to contribute to the channel, this is an excellent way to do that. And we really, really appreciate it. And one other thing, um, a couple comments have been made regarding my use of hats. And I think people maybe think I'm trying to hide baldness and I'm not, I've got a full head of hair under here. <laughs> I lost my hair when I was 20. Uh, in the summer, I never wear hats. I have my hat off all the time. I am in Des Moines, Iowa. And a lot of times in my house, I am wearing a beanie or a stocking cap or at least a hat. For those bald people out there like this, you know what it's like. When your head is cold, it's kind of like your feet being cold. So I hope that answers some people's questions out there as to what I'm hiding under my hat. And I, I'm really not hiding anything. As uh, we get into the summer, you will see my hat on my head a lot less. Um, so for all you investigators trying to poke and prod and see if I've got something I'm trying to hide, I'm not trying to hide anything. I went bald very early in age. I am very, very close to 50. I'm happily married. Fashion and my appearance really is one of the lowest things on my priority list. I really don't care. So this channel is about vintage audio. My, my appearance, I don't care about it. You shouldn't care about it. Hopefully you're here to hear about a hobby that we all share. And that's it. We can move on from, is Kevin bald? I bet he's bald. And um, I bet he's bald and he's ashamed of it. And he's embarrassed. So he wears a hat all the time. Uh, long time ago, guys. Long time ago. So anyway, with that, let's get into why we're here, which is the mistakes I've made over the years buying and selling vintage audio equipment. Let's do it. Yay. Mistake number one, when you're just starting out, try to buy quality over quantity. A lot of people, including myself, you know, were thrifters. I was a thrifter. That's how I started. I would go to every estate sale, Goodwill, you know, you name it. I was on the hunt for vintage audio. I would go around to Goodwills and Salvation Army type places and give them a business card, which just really had my name and number. And I think it said vintage audio on it. And I would give it to every employee there and say, hey, if you get the silver shiny stuff, give me a call. And most of the time I didn't get calls. I had one guy that would feed me um, some pieces every once in a while, but most of it was, it was just junk. Uh, my point is, is until you get going or until you have an established way of getting rid of the equipment, it can be really daunting. You can end up with rooms full of equipment that is either unrepairable or it's just not worth anything. You know, it's kind of being junk drunk is what I call it. And I've been junk drunk a lot in my life where I walk into somebody's house and they've got just tonnage. My naive self says, hey, would you take 400 bucks for everything in the room, you know, type of thing. And sometimes they do. And then, you know, you're renting a U-Haul trailer, you're loading it up, you're bringing it home, 
you're testing it because you can't quite test everything there. Uh, one one situation I can think of was where I bought a um, a radio station that had closed down in northern Iowa, and I got a lot of really good stuff out of it. But the amount of time it took to sort and you know pull the good out from the bad because they wanted it all gone. It was either you know you take it all or nothing. You know some of that equipment I still have today. Some of the parts I still have today. But in retrospect, when I think about it, it probably wasn't worth all the time and effort that it took uh, to go through and figure out the good from the bad. So when you're just starting out and you don't necessarily know what you're doing, really good piece of advice is stick to the good quality items and leave the big lots to somebody that has a way of getting rid of things quickly. That would be my first bit of advice, quality over quantity when you're first getting going. This might be one of the biggest ones on the list and we see this all the time. If you buy something on eBay, the first thing you do when that shows up on your door is fully test it. I mean test everything. Test FM, test AM, test auxiliary, test tape, test the, the two speaker outputs, you know, A and B or A, B and C if it has them test the phono preamp, and put it through its paces. Run that thing for a couple days. Make sure there's no gremlins in there. And if there are, you need to immediately contact the seller and put in for a return. That is the best option is immediately return it. A couple things are going to happen. Either they're going to come back and say, hey, sorry, I overlooked that. Maybe they didn't realize. There are a lot of flippers on eBay too. They might not have use that unit for eight hours, let it warmed up really well to start seeing the problems it has. They might not be being completely deceptive. However, you want to find those now because they might offer you a little bit of a return. You know, let's say you pay $200 for a receiver. Maybe they say, hey, can you live with that problem? I'll return you 50 bucks. That's an option. Or they might say, and this is the one you want to watch out for, is they say, take it to a repair shop and I will pay for the repairs. And this is why you never want to do that. And that's because any reputable repair shop local to you most likely is going to be way further behind than the 30-day warranty on eBay. And what I mean by that is eBay guarantees your purchase to be as described. So if they say everything works in the description and it doesn't, eBay is going to get you your money back no matter what. Now, if you take it to a repair shop and it takes two months to get your estimate to get it fixed, if you go back to the seller and you say, okay, it's going to be $150 to repair this, that seller knows that they are free and clear. They're past the 30-day window, which they have to return your money. So I get this question all the time. I bought this on eBay. It's got this problem. And I literally just hand it back to him and I go, stop return this right now. Get your money back, get a different one. There's a lot of things you can do on eBay. We actually have a video on how to purchase items on eBay. There are some really good pointers, some things that you need to look out for. Go watch that video. But this is the main one. Once again, if it's not as described, immediately put in for a return. Most likely the seller's going to be very cool. Maybe they're going to help you out with the price. But either way, you need to get started on that as soon as possible. And the next tip, do a little research. You know, if you're out looking for a cassette deck or a reel-to-reel, -reel, um, an old pop-up VCR, you know, people collect the craziest stuff. Make sure there's somebody local in your area that works on it. Because as of now, in Des Moines, Iowa, I don't know anybody that works on reel-to-reels. I don't know anybody that works on cassette decks. I definitely don't know anybody that works on VCRs or DVD players or any of that kind of stuff. It's, it's getting tough to find people that will service some of that stuff. So... Before you go go crazy and buy a really expensive Nakamichi Dragon, you know, think you're going to relive your glory days of the 80s with your cars, cassette tapes, and stuff, make sure that somebody local is willing to work on it. And then I would definitely get it serviced ASAP. If not, buy it from somebody that has just serviced it. Cassette decks are pretty tricky. Reel-to-reels are really tricky. A lot of moving parts, a lot of electronics. You want to make sure somebody around you knows how to fix them before you buy one. Otherwise, unfortunately, 
you should probably just avoid it. And this next one, I've been burnt on several times myself. Um, people will bring in speakers or I'll go to buy speakers in a hurry. That's always the wrong way to buy anything, but you'll see speakers and they've got the rotted woofer, you know, the surrounds have rotted away. And you might think, well, there's no point in testing these. I don't want to hurt the woofers. The problem with that is a lot of times you might have a bad tweeter or a bad mid range. And now you need to not only refoam the woofers, but now you need to source replacement tweeters or mid ranges. It happens a lot. We started testing all speakers coming in for refoams because a lot of times the customer put their speakers away years ago. They hadn't used them and the, the foams rotted. They bring them in. We do a foam job on it and lo and behold, we go to test them and they've got a tweeter or mid range out and we've got to explain to them that, you know, not only do you have a bill for the refoam, but you also need to buy some mid ranges or tweeters. So always test speakers. You don't have to put a ton of power into them, but you definitely want to check, make sure the tweeters, the mid ranges and the woofers are working. A good way to do this is just grab a piece of wood or you know even a record album, anything, and hold it over the speakers you're not wanting to test and then put your ear up to the tweeter. Now don't crank it up, you don't wanna hurt your ears, and then cover up the tweeter, listen to the mid-range. Then cover up the tweeter in the mid-range and listen to the woofer. You should be able to hear something coming out of each one of those. Test all the drivers. You'll get burnt eventually, you will. And once again, the seller might not even know. It's not really their fault, they're not trying to be deceptive, they just don't know. This is one I figured out a while ago, and that is rare does not always equal valuable. If anything, rare actually equals hard to sell. There were a lot of boutique manufacturers. There were a lot of smaller run speakers and amplifiers, mainly speakers though, at least is where I see it. You know, they might be incredibly well built. They might sound incredible. They might look incredible. But if nobody knows to look for them or it doesn't have that brand recognition, they're not going to sell very well. A pair that comes to mind for me was a pair of Sony speakers. They were SS 3300s, extremely rare, extremely large, extremely well built, maybe the coolest woofer I've ever seen in my life. The crossover network on this thing was insane. The problem, they all have faulty tweeters in them. You can't find them. Nobody knows to look for them. People would come in, they're huge. People would come in and they'd see them and they sounded great, but nobody knew of them. It was hard to find a customer for them. So sometimes rare is not, is not good, especially in vintage audio. The more rare it is, the less parts you're gonna have, whether it be cosmetic, internals, even maybe schematics, everything. Everything is just gonna be harder to find, including a buyer. Rare is not always a good thing. Sometimes it just means it's rare. Take a picture of it and let somebody else own it. You know? Another really good tip. And somebody else gave this tip to me a while ago. I don't know where, but I started doing it and they were 100% correct. And that is for all you flippers or garage sale thrifty type people, always, always, always ask if they have records or old stereo equipment especially if you see old stereo equipment or old records. You have no idea how many times I would go to a garage sale and I would see an old set of speakers and I'd say, hey, do you have the rest of that? Or, hey, you don't happen to have any records, do you? And they go, oh yeah, we do. I just didn't think anybody would want them. Or vice versa, you'll see a stack of records and you'll say, hey, do you have any old stereo equipment that you used to use with those? Oh yeah, I just didn't think anybody would want them. I bought so many speakers and stereos and, and vinyl records from doing just that, that eventually it just became, it became so second nature that I just asked everybody. And you know, if you are in the hobby, if you do do a lot of thrifting, make a little flyer, have a little list of everything you're looking for, whether it's vintage video games, stereo equipment, records, whatever, and just hand it to them. It doesn't cost anything. Print it off, cut it into force, hand it to them. You'd be surprised how many times that will get you a piece of equipment 
or some really cool records or some old video games or whatever it is you're looking for. Um, you're spending the time to go there. Might as well ask. I've never had anybody get mad at me for asking. So anyway, do that. That is a huge, huge, huge tip if you're wanting to find some good deals in records and old stair equipment. Absolutely. Ask. Ask them. Just ask them. And this might end up being two parts. I think it's going to be because I think it's the video's already gone long enough. I might do another video here in two or three months or whatever. But uh, don't let anybody tell you what sounds good. Don't let them, don't get online and let somebody tell you that this doesn't sound good or that doesn't sound good. You need to hear it because there's so much, there's so much misinformation out there. It's like, Let's just use Bose as an example. Bose, certain Bose speakers in the right situation sound incredible. You just need the right room for it. And somebody might not like, like, somebody might not like Klipsch, or somebody might not like Bose, or somebody might not like Kenwood, or whatever. And you might end up really liking it. It might be your favorite piece of equipment. So, I really think you need to go out and kind of experience it for yourself. That's one reason why we don't focus a lot on the sound because sound is so, it's so much the ear of the beholder. And I don't want to try and persuade people maybe not to try something that they might like because I didn't like it. I'd rather talk about the build quality, whether something is good or not, whether it's serviceable. And most stuff from the 70s is really good quality. It all sounds really good. Most of it comes down to semantics with how it sounds. A little bit more top end, a little fuller in the bass. Eh. So don't look past a set of Bose speakers because three people on your Facebook group said Bose suck when all they listen to are Sirwin Vegas clips or JBL. Who cares? I've heard Bose in specific rooms sound really good. 901s can sound really good in the right room. Just keep an open mind. You might find something you really like that you might not have if you had listened to some guy that still lives in their parents' basement. I mean, who cares what they think anyway? They're probably just regurgitating something else that somebody else said. I mean, how many times has that happened? Anyway, put your own ears on it. You know, uh, experience it for yourself. A lot of this stuff's not that bad. So anyway, that's my last point. Don't let other people tell you what you like. If you like something, own it. It's yours, you know? Who cares? Who cares what those people think? Most of them don't know what they're talking about anyway. So, including myself. Why would I tell you what you should like? I'm not going to. It's silly. So, yeah. Try as much as you can. Listen to as much as you can. Experience as much as you can. That's what I'm trying to do. And hopefully make some good purchases along the way so you're not you know, you're not, you don't have three storage units that you're paying a bunch of money for, for stuff that you can't get rid of anyway. You know, maybe make a little money along the way. That would be ideal. So anyway, I am going to get back to the soggy, cold winter day here in Des Moines, Iowa. I hope everybody's doing good. I'm really looking forward to spring. I'm sure everybody else is too, at least that's in winter right now. Check out the membership program. Got some cool announcements coming up. I promise you really do. And, um, We'll see you in the next one. Really appreciate it. Thanks a bunch.